Hi, everyone. Hi, Minister. How are you? Good. I can unmute. Okay. Uh, yes. That's my cue. <laughs> Hi, it's Anne. So, it's so rare for two politicians to be muted, right? <laughs> It's one of the reasons why the House of Commons is working fairly well these days, is the speaker commute. Isn't that true? Isn't yes. Um, I think we're going to wait for just, uh, okay, I think we're good to go. Okay. Uh, we're letting in um, lots of people, Minister, uh, lots of people have signed up to listen to our conversation this afternoon in relation to Canada's energy future. But before we get to the substance of our talk, let me introduce myself. I'm Anne McClellan. Um, and I'm senior, I am a senior advisor in the public policy practice group at uh, Bennett Jones. I'm also a member of the advisory board for Canada 2020. Um, and as some people listening to us today will remember, I was a minister of a number of things in the governments of Prime Ministers Gretchen and Martin. And my very first portfolio was in fact as Minister of Natural Resources. I want to welcome everyone this afternoon to the Recovery Project live stream on Canada's energy future. And as I've already mentioned, I'm delighted to be chatting with the Minister of Natural Resources this afternoon, the Honorable Seamus Regan. And you are where this afternoon? Are you in home in St. John's? Home in St. John's, appropriately yep. social distancing and all Indeed. those things. Indeed. Let me just say a few words about the Recovery Project. It is an initiative launched by Canada 2020, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa and Global Progress. And it's focused on marshalling resources to look ahead from the COVID-19 pandemic, which we're all living through right now, and consider how we can leverage this period of recovery to build stronger and more resilient economies, more responsive institutions, and smarter public policy. For more information about the Recovery Project, please visit recoveryproject.org and follow us on Twitter at recoveryproj, P-R-O-J. As I mentioned, I am joined by our special guest, the Honorable Seamus O'Regan this afternoon, Minister of Natural Resources. And we're going to have an, about an hour long conversation about Canada's energy future. But I do want to tell you a few things about the minister before we get started. The oh, minister, yeah, okay. as many of you know, don't be scared, right? Do you remember when you interviewed me on Canada AM all those years ago? I don't know how many times, and I was always fair. Yeah, you, you were, but you have no idea how pleased I am to be the one asking you questions. <laughs> yes, indeed. But the minister was first elected in 2015, again in 2019. He represents a riding in St. John's, as I've said, Newfoundland and Labrador. And I think it's great that you're Minister of Natural Resources for a whole bunch of reasons, but one of which is that you come from a resource-rich province, you come from an energy producing province. You have significant oil, offshore oil and gas uh, mm. assets. And dare I say, you probably have a surplus of hydropower. <laughs> Putting a mile in. Yes. <laughs> but I know there will be a market for that. <laughs> there will. At a reasonable price. I always like to learn new things about people with whom I'm participating in these kinds of events. And one thing I did not know about you, Minister, was that, in fact, you completed your master's degree at Cambridge University, mm. and your thesis was on the topic of Indigenous participation in Canada's natural resource development. And yes. I cannot think of a subject more important and more appropriate right now for our resource sectors, and in particular, our energy sector. And, of course, you were previous to this portfolio, portfolio Minister of Indigenous Services. So let me just say it's a great pleasure to be chatting with you this afternoon and uh, we look forward, obviously, I look forward to our conversation, but I know uh, we both look forward to the questions 
uh, uh, people will be pro uh, asking of you. And uh, I encourage the audience in the chat function to uh, start uh, soon putting up your questions, comments, whatever it might be. And I will try, even with my poor eyesight, to read as many of them as possible from the chat room. And certainly we are going to dedicate at least the last 15 minutes of this discussion to participants' questions. So again, Minister, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, this session is entitled Canada's Energy Future. I like to think of uh, this in terms of the role that energy will play in our countries and dare I say the world's economic recovery from an event none of us have lived through before, a global pandemic, where the answer to the pandemic was basically to tell everybody to stay at home and shut down the economy, not yeah. only in this country, but globally. So it's something we really haven't lived through before. And now it's about how you restart that economy, uh, hence the recovery project and the role that energy will play in a successful uh, uh, economic recovery. Uh, I think most people would agree that energy is going to have to be central to that. It is going to have to be at the heart of any re economic recovery plan. When you think about, and here are just a couple of numbers, Minister, that you know well, net exports of energy in 2019 from our country were $76 billion. $62 billion of that was crude oil. There is no other sector that comes close to that in terms of exports. And no sector that is going to come, be, come close to that anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to appreciate that if we're talking about economic recovery, uh, energy has to be a key part. It has to be central to that economic recovery, whatever that looks like. But of course, you and I both know energy is about more than oil. It's about natural gas. It's about renewables. It's about nuclear. It's about hydro. They are all part of an energy mix that needs to get cleaner and greener faster. That's right. So, Minister, that's your challenge. You are responsible <laughs> at the federal level for the single biggest export sector this country's got. And yeah. you've got all this pressure from civil society and from the markets and elsewhere to make it greener, greener and cleaner faster. So, big, big context setting um, uh, question there in terms of where do you see this uh, at and where do you see it's going? Well, and, and let's talk about where I am. I mean, I am in a I am in a energy producing province, as you pointed out, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, and a province that uh, is uh, even more dependent on oil and gas um, than Alberta is on its royalties, um, uh, if you can believe it. Um, and it's in a precarious position as well because uh, just because of you know the two things that hit the oil and gas industry with, with the pandemic, and and as you point out, and rightly. Um, the pandemic is very different than, you know, the recession of, of 10, 12 years ago, uh, where you had some, some bad actors that, you know, created, a, a, you know, began the steps towards recession, I would argue. But, but here, we've had, you know, we asked businesses, shut down. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it, it's a very different area. But in, in the case of oil and gas, we did two things, or you had two things. You had demand destruction, because we're not flying. You know, I didn't fly to Ottawa to meet you for this, and you didn't fly to Ottawa to meet me for this. Um, and then you had a, a price war that everybody's still getting over. OPEC Plus is doing its best to salvage it. But, you know, this began with Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, it really, it hit me, uh, you know, and I had said it on several occasions that, you know, Canada is the fourth biggest producer of oil in the world. It really hit me when I started doing, you know, by Zoom and, and everything, uh, international energy agency meetings and, uh, and the like. And I would be asked to be a keynote speaker. And, uh, well, why? Well, because Canada is a top five producer in the world. Yeah. That's when, and then when you see, you know, many other countries that you normally associate and identify, and they identify as being more producing nations looking at you, that's when it really sinks in. Um, I, I spoke at, at Globe, which I think many of the viewers here, people who are with us uh, would, would know, for, you know, the biggest clean tech summit in uh, North America, it's in Vancouver. And I went there and, and gave a speech that said, 
we will never achieve net zero without oil and gas. We will, we will not achieve net zero in this country without oil and gas um, and without Alberta, Newfoundland and Labrador and Saskatchewan. Um, and I didn't say that to be overly antagonistic um, or to say that I'm any less driven or ambitious about net zero, but we have a responsibility to tackle that when our economy uh, is, it, so much of our economy is occupied by oil and gas, more than most people think. You know it, being in Alberta, I know it, being you know five minutes away from a waterfront where I see supply vessels heading out to the rigs every, every 10 minutes. I'm, I'm reminded of that fact. So I gave that speech at Globe, and then the next day I, I co-hosted a, a summit with uh, an innovation summit with the oil and gas industry with Simon Savage, uh, the Minister of Energy in Alberta. And I said, There's, there is not going to be a future for our oil and gas industry unless we commit to net zero. Right. That is not, it's a, it's a heck of a challenge, but one does not contradict the other. And, and in fact, it found a receptive audience. I mean, I think the way I put it and, and what we're realizing is that investment dollars, we saw most recently with the Norwegian Sovereign Fund, we saw with Sweden, notably with BlackRock, BlackRock, is that investment dollars are moving towards jurisdictions that are taking climate change seriously, where they see real progress being made on lowering emissions and greening their energy. And, uh, and that's a fact. Uh, it's something that Mark Carney was talking about years ago. It is now hitting the streets. And, and what I said to uh, Minister Savage and, uh, and to others who were there was, what you don't want to be is, is you don't want a scenario, and I, I think it's playing out, we're on Wall Street or Bay Street or in the city of London or in Zurich, uh, you have portfolio managers who are sitting at the end of the, of the long conference room table looking at their analysts and saying, what are we doing about climate change? And just having somebody put up their hand and saying, well, we just, we're, we're, we're not going near Canadian oil now. Yeah. And then you become the box to check. You don't want to become the box to check, right? Uh, you, don't want to be, you don't want to become that simple answer. And, and on the other side of the ledger, what is increasingly becoming the box to check as well is net zero. They're looking for jurisdictions that commit to net zero. So that's, that was where I was. And, and, uh, and then COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then, the, you know, you had these twin crises that have hit the oil and gas industry. Uh, a you see a recovery taking place. You see Brent crude uh, climbing back up there now. Um, you know, we went through that scare in, in April of, uh, of negative $34 barrel oil uh, from, uh, from uh, the Western Canadian Select. Uh, you know, the, that, was a, that was dizzying times. Um, there is still a hell of a lot we need to go through. But we now, I think, have a commitment, and I think that, I think that we have a, an understanding in this country and in many other countries as well, similar countries to ours, that realize that if, if we can get through this together, that and by this I mean COVID-19, which I think we're doing, then we can solve these problems together. And I, you know, I don't want to, it sounds a little hallmark, uh, but, but I believe that, I believe that. And uh, it, it takes will. Uh, it also takes an honest assessment, I would say, of the problems and of the challenges. And that is so important. I, I'm, I'm just, by challenging, I think, you know, the perception of two sides of the debate, I'm trying to bring people together to understand common challenges and, and the necessity for meeting those challenges. Um, you mentioned investors and net zero. One of the things that I have heard from certain fund managers and elsewhere is that they are starting to hear the right things from the energy sector, especially, obviously, uh, the oil and gas part of that sector. That, and we've seen, we've seen some companies uh, make a commitment publicly to net zero. But what those investors say, and fund managers, is there's not a plan, right? Before they yeah. are confident in terms of that net zero, they are saying to companies, where's the plan? It's all very well. We can all get on board, right? 2050 seems a long way out there. Uh, let's make that commitment. But they are saying, we want more concrete information about the risks to you getting there and the opportunities in getting there. Uh, and then the companies say, okay, we understand that in terms of our strategic planning. We can't identify all the risks, all the opportunities. But then they also say, government, Government, tell us, one, how you're going to help us 
get to net zero, if we mm -hmm. make that commitment, what are the things you can do to help us and work with us productively in partnership, as opposed to maybe creating an impression that somehow certain parts of the energy sector are the problem, not, as you say, part of the solution. Agreed, agreed. Concentrate on the emissions, not necessarily the source of those emissions. Concentrate on the emissions. Um, but it is fair to say that, you know, looking at the source of emissions, I mean, obviously, you know, oil and gas as it is, is something that we have to tackle. Do not discount, I don't think, the psychological importance of committing to net zero. There's something to that, okay? You got to follow up with action. I agree. But, you know, I, what my, my challenge to industry has been, you know, when we talk about moonshots, and you hear people talking about moonshots, moonshots not just kind of throwing past a, you know, spaghetti against the wall, seeing what sticks kind of thing. A moonshot, I think, as, a, as, a, you know, as NASA defined it in, in, in action, was we're going to the moon. Now, how do we get there? And that's the important level where, you know, we got to get, obviously. I'm very proud that my province, not uh, a week and a half ago, uh, committed to net zero um, by 2050. Uh, and I think that that's a really important move. And, and psychologically, I can just see that start to permeate in the industry here. Um, and I can see it permeate in, in, in the government here. There's something to that. Now, we got to work together on how we, uh, how we reach it. No question about it. I'm not one of these ministers, Anne, and you probably, and you, you've been in, in several portfolios, you walk in, and I, I'm demanding that, you know, I start everything again. Let's do this, you know, forget the, the studies that have been done, even the recent studies. Um, before me, Amarjeet Sohi and Jim Carr did great work on, on a plan called Generation Energy. Um, and, you know, I, I had read it before, but, you know, devoured it once I got into the portfolio right away. Um, because, uh, because Jim and Amarjeet said, make sure you know it well. And, and I, you know, I read it and, uh, you know, it's, it is, it is ambitious, but doable. And the biggest thing is that you had some significant players there from the industry, um, both from the renewable and non-renewable sectors, uh, the, which both two very broad categories, but you know what I mean? Um, as well as, uh, as well as indigenous participation in this, which is, you know, as you said, um, something that's very personal and very important to me. Um, I mean, just a, on a tangent on that, I mean, I, um, I, I was policy advisor to Brian Tobin, your old colleague in cabinet, when he came back to Newfoundland to be premier. Um, before that, I was uh, executive assistant to the Minister of Justice, but he was the minister responsible for Labrador. And I moved from St. John's at the age of 12 or 13 and moved to Labrador, had not met indigenous people before, and now was going to school with them. And it, if, if, to live, to work, to be, to to have friends to this day, and who are First Nations Inuit, um, will uh, sit with you in a big way. It changed my life. Um, it gave uh, my, my academic work purpose. It's what I did in my undergraduate was my honors thesis on Indigenous mobilization against development that they didn't want, and and then my master's was on equity versus royalty if, if participating in large scale uh, economic development. Having, having them part of that as well. So this is a federation, all that to say, it's complicated. It involves provinces, it involves uh, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, uh, it, it involves uh, industry in a big, big and meaningful way uh, over a number of sectors. Um, uh, so it is not going to be easy. And, and I think making the psychological commitment of committing to net zero is very important. We are at that stage though, I think where uh, there is going to be great collective will I think that is going to come from this. I think that the energy that we're seeing, albeit in a mainly unrelated topic, uh, it, you know, a cause that we're seeing occurring on the streets right now, um, I think I think is huge. And and I think if we can and we must make meaningful action there, people will demand rightly meaningful action here. I wonder if this is fair or not. I'm going to put this in play. Um, it won't come as a surprise to you. Um, there are those who feel that this government um, is, not, is not fully supportive of the energy sector. I just mm -hmm. gave you the numbers, right? In terms of it is by far our biggest export industry sector, mm -hmm. right? By far. Um, you would expect a government to be talking up that everywhere they go in terms of the sector, not only domestically, but in terms of globally, on the global scene, in terms of what Canada has to offer in terms of the energy space. I think 
some people wonder what what will it take for the, this government in particular to get behind the energy sector and maybe in a way give it the pride of place it deserves in terms of our overall prosperity, the good jobs it creates, uh, and so on. And here I'm not, I'm not talking only about oil and gas, and yes, we know lots of focus on that for a bunch of reasons, including climate change, but the mm -hmm. energy sector writ large, the clean technologies we should be developing to mm -hmm. apply to uh, the, the energy sector, our expertise in things like nuclear power, uh, what, what, what does it take, or have you given any thought to what it will take to change the perception that this government does not see energy as an absolutely key domestic and export sector. I've got a, a big. Or am question. I being unfair? Am no, I, being unfair? I, I, I would. No, no, no. I think. I think it's. I think it's a perception. I think we got a big pipeline uh, called TMX that might, you know, poke a major hole in that argument. Right. Um, I think that uh, I think that the way that we have you know gone about this and saying that the revenues in our in our in our position on, on TMX uh, will fund clean tech, will fund renewables, um, I think was a was a was a way of 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 finding that middle ground. I, I make absolutely no apologies for attempting to find that middle ground, because being hell bent on 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 advocating for for the oil and gas industry got us nowhere but in court for way too long and didn't get nearly enough built in the right way. Um, I will never forget where I was for the TMX decision, actually, uh, you know, from the Federal Court of Appeal, because there were, uh, like, you I know, that's how they well You remember it well as well. You know, it was, what it gave us was a roadmap, and a roadmap on, on not just TMX, but a roadmap on on how we go about consultation with, with, with First Nations, with, with Métis, uh, with Inuit, how we, how, you know, you find that reasonable accommodation. Um, how you seek it out and how you get things built. And it gave us, you know, we went in with a checklist of here's what we did and what we got back was, well, for the most part, yeah, you got it right. Um, that's huge, 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 I think, in this country. It means that we no longer kind of tiptoe around things, but that we, you know, we know what we need to do. We sit down with the partners we need to do it with and we get it done. Um, I'm very proud uh, to come from this province and I'm very proud of the industry here. It is being challenged significantly. We got a lot of work to do, um, but I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud of what's been built here, and I'm proud of what's been built in Alberta. And and the innovation that has been shown in Alberta and Saskatchewan, Newfoundland and Labrador, and just to talk about oil and gas for a second, that innovation is what we need now. So we need people on board. And uh, I have, from the from the get go, and in my in my time previous, uh, in in the two portfolios I held previous, and as a member of Parliament, have have you know, spoken about how proud I feel about it. Um, and I think that that, you know, people either sense that or they don't, and then you gotta follow that up with, you gotta follow that up with action. But I am challenging, you know, I have to challenge industry and I have to challenge all sides because that is the only way we're gonna do this. And I am, you know, back to, you know, going to international energy agency meetings and international conferences, albeit, you know, by Zoom and, and very effective and productive. Um, people look to us, they are looking to us. They're, you know, I, I have, I've been reading Jim Prentice's book, and I, I, I read it as soon as I got in, Triple Crown. And I knew Jim. Uh, Jim, was, uh, Jim was a music fan. And, uh, and so I knew him from Canada, and I knew he'd go to all the Juno's parties and stuff. I'd always see him and try and, uh, you know, go in the corner and have a chat with him, it was, you know, to be, uh, because I respected what he was doing. I mean, he, he believed, I knew how fervently he, he believed in, in pursuing uh, indigenous rights, uh, about getting the environment right, and being proud of, of his province and of, and of his industry that he, that he was working with. And, and, you know, one of the things that Jim keeps saying in his book, I refer to it all the time, rest in peace, was there is no other democracy on the planet that has the bounty of natural resources that we do. I speak to other nations that are democracies, I speak to other nations with, with similar bounty of natural resources, but not democracies. There's nobody else in the league that we are in, you know? And so the, the world looks to us. And uh, it means that uh, none of this is easy. It means that we don't get to stand on a soapbox and tell the world how it should be, because they're gonna look to us and say, well, if you've got quite a bit going on yourself, what are you doing? 
So this is the hard work. This is the roll up the sleeves part. I think you're right about the fact it is hard work, isn't it? We, for so many reasons and so many pressures, both domestic and uh, external. And you're actually having to deal, all of us actually, with a fundamental transformation of the energy sector, energy being fundamental to everything we do. Yeah. And that, when was the last time? I mean, the industrial revolution, perhaps? I'm, I'm not sure, the arrival of the combustion engine, in terms of that, the kind of transformation that is being asked of the energy sector right now. Yeah, we, we, we need national will. We cannot leave workers behind. We cannot leave regions of this country behind. Right. I, that's, I am absolutely adamant about that. Not in a democracy, because if not, if people feel left behind, if whole parts of the country feel left behind, they will elect a government that does not leave them behind. Yep, absolutely. So you have to include as many people and get that buy-in. Yep. I look at what we did a month and a half ago uh, in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia with inactive and orphan wells. And Anne, there will probably never be another time where you see Jason Kenney and Elizabeth May all agree and, and, and their constituencies on something. Now, you know, this was an overnight success, I would say, you know, months in the making, uh, maybe years in the making, I should say. Um, but but it, it, what, it, what we did was we concentrated on workers. I dealt an awful lot with labor. Um, we found within an active and an or, an orphan wells, we found meaningful, uh, high value, high tech work that would employ thousands of people that would do the right thing environmentally. Um, and that would, in, in, in this COVID time, would allow workers and companies to remain whole and the, and the industry to remain as intact as possible while it undergoes coming out of COVID and a transformation that, that it, you know, is, is, is here. And, and that was, and, and right now that's worked. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the subscription for uh, what, what they're doing in Alberta is over the, over the top. And Saskatchewan and British Columbia, the same thing. It's that concentration on workers and, uh, and on the companies that they have to go back and work for. And, and what did we learn from that? You know, uh, collective will, um, environmental purpose, concentration on workers. And, 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 when you, and when you're dealing with transition and change, which are tough words for a lot of people, people who have families, people who have mortgages, people who have car payments, they don't want to hear transition. You know, you want to know you're okay. And, and so, you know, you want to talk about, about lowering emissions. You, you want to talk, you know, you, you want to talk about uh, change that is necessary um, and change that is steady, but meaningful and, and, and urgent. And, you know, therein lies the conundrum. Therein lies the challenge. This all has to be done urgently. Let me uh, just talk to you before we go, and as you can imagine, Minister, oh my gosh, we've got a lot of questions. But before we go there, in terms of the energy sector, as I said at the beginning, it is more than oil and gas, although there are lots of reasons why people focus on oil and gas. Uh, but renewables. Yes. Renewables are a growing part of the energy equation. Clearly, when you think of energy and climate change, uh, global warming, renewables have to be a key part of that. Do you think we're doing enough? Do you think we're doing enough research? Uh, do we have the right incentives in place? Huge growth of renewables in some parts of the world. Uh, what do you think in terms of where we're at on renewables? I think we have lots of brain power. Anybody who goes to Globe uh, is just awestruck by uh, the level of ingenuity in this country um, and, and, and you know, what the, the ambition, there's no question. Um, we, I think we've got it, we're still working on incentives. I'm amazed by how uh, quickly things can turn even in the US even at this time. Um, while on the one hand, you're seeing the Trump administration um, saying that it will not account for climate change when building infrastructure uh, and getting rid of that. Um, at the same time, uh, they're putting incredible stateside incentives. On, on carbon sequestration, um, Texas particularly, and, and now most recently in the past couple of weeks on small modular reactors, on nuclear energy. So, you know, you're always trying to keep up with our, other jurisdictions when it comes to these incentives. I think another, we also, I think, should probably not take anything for granted. I mean, one of the, one, 
one of the biggest one of the biggest bounties we have is hydroelectricity, uh, and it exists. Uh, so you know, how do we how do we you know get the tie-ins perhaps uh, that you know we see, let's say, in British Columbia, that we see in, in Manitoba, that we see in Labrador, where I grew up, um, where you have a bounty of hydroelectricity. These tie-ins, you know, just basically getting it to market, getting the electricity to market is, is hugely expensive. But at the end of the day, can really, by electrifying our grid even further, can really get us there. And, and you know, because I hit on that note as well, nuclear, um, you know, the, the, uh, the promise of small modular reactors is really something. And now that we're judging things by, um, uh, you know, lowering emissions, I mean, we look in a 15 year period where France suddenly became, you know, 90% non emitting um, through an incredibly ambitious nuclear program uh, of theirs in, in, in the 60s and 70s. Um, so those are things we should be looking at. But there's you know, lots of exciting technologies too, and a lot of potential, particularly in hydrogen, um, you know, LNG, we've got great ambitions to be the cleanest LNG producer in the world. Uh, it is gonna take, it, there is no panacea, that's for sure. Um, it is gonna take a mix of all of these things. Um, and, and, it, and it's going to take either, you know, reminding ourselves of what we have in the case of hydroelectricity or also looking at ways in a new, looking at things in a new light, such as nuclear. You, uh, you mentioned brain power and obviously R&D, right, in terms of moving yeah. some of these things like small modular reactors. And in the interest of full disclosure, I do sit on the board of Cameco, which is the world's largest publicly traded, traded uranium producer. So obviously, we see ourselves as very much in the nuclear power industry, generally very much part of uh, dealing with climate change. Um, my last trip, I should note, Anne, my last trip before the lockdown was to Cigar Lake, to, to the uranium mine there, right. and, to, and to adjacent First Nations where, because 50% of the workers at that mine uh, are, are First Nations, and I, to visit their communities and talk to them about the future. Exactly. And before COVID-19, in fact, I think Cameco was the country's largest employer of uh, Aboriginal Canadians, something that we've worked hard on and something that we're very proud of, those partnerships. But you've mentioned uh, SMRs. Um, obviously, uh, that's infrastructure. But then there's other infrastructure. If we're going to get a hydrogen economy going, it's going to take infrastructure. Mm -hmm. If we in Alberta last week were, were very pleased to see the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line yes. go Operation. It's the world's largest CO2 pipeline. Um, and uh, obviously, this takes good public policy, mm -hmm. smart people willing to, let's say, take a risk, and money for infrastructure. That carbon trunk pipeline would not have been built but for Premier Ed Spelmack and the money he put into it way back a decade ago. And then the federal, a previous federal government put money into the pipe. It's a 1.6 or something billion dollar project. All of this doesn't come cheap. New no. grids, right? Electrification, none of this comes cheap. Um, where do you think uh, again, the partnerships are and the role of the government of Canada in making sure that we're building the infrastructure for the future, the energy future. We've got a big opportunity to tackle that now. Um, you know, and, and I think uh, uh, this is a prime, you know, prime minister's uh, determined to do that. And, um, and, you know, there are a number of us that are because of our various departments who are working pretty steadily on that. You know as well as I do, I am blessed. Uh, the, the employees, the officials at, uh, at Natural Resources Canada are smart as whips and ambitious and driven. And uh, I'm so impressed by them. And, uh, and on, a, on, on, you know, on a whole, on, on everything that you just mentioned, um, you know, on carbon sequestration, I think you know, uh, what we're trying to build now is the model to incentivize further car carbon sequestration. How do, you, how do you incent the market? Uh, there is nothing that will drive change faster than the market. Um, you know, that is, that is, that is the, the power that Mark Carney talks about. That is, uh, you know, the, the, the future that is confronting our oil and gas industries as well, is uh, they see where the investment dollars are flowing, and if you do not change, then the investment will not flow. So, you know, there is nothing, there is nothing that, will, that will provide that discipline uh, or that ambition more than, than the market. 
Um, and in some ways it's getting there. Carbon sequestration uh, was, was, you know, for some people a pipe dream. Now we are seeing not just carbon sequestration, but, but you know, companies like BC's uh, carbon engineering, where they're, you know, they're looking at extracting carbon from the air and then sequestering that. I mean, it's, um, there, as we are confronted with the changes uh, occurring in our climate, that, that ambition is getting greater and greater and greater. The, the trick is to incenting that to make sure that the marketplace gets there too. And that is something that we are, that we are working on. I, like I said, I think we've got a huge opportunity right now and we're, God knows, we're steady at it. Um, you know, Jonathan Wilkinson, uh, myself, Catherine McKenna, frankly, just every, every member of cabinet, I think is uh, quite seized with this. Um, how, you know, if, if we look at stimulating the economy, how do we make sure that we're making the correct investments that, that work for people and will ultimately work to help us achieve our 2030 to 2050 goals? Okay, let's go to a few questions. Yes, uh, yes. From the audience, we've got a lot. You and I could probably talk all day about various things, including my old department and how great it is. But uh, let us go to a few questions. Now, you are responsible for the Canadian Energy Regulator. Mm -hmm. So, what is the role of the regulator? In, in is that dog? Are you hearing the dog barking? Yes. Yes. I apologize. I, that's okay. I'm a dog owner. I love dogs, so we'll take that all out. Don't worry. What is the role of the regulator in enabling innovation and the right investments and practices to use this recovery phase to seriously get? on track to meet net zero and increased indigenous participation boy i think that's a big question you could take uh, i think really i mean the question what is the role of the regulator there's been a lot of controversy uh, bill c69 around the creation of the so-called new regulator the canadian energy regulator but regulators do play a role in innovation Mm -hmm. um, they have to if they're doing their job. They're, mm -hmm. They push as, as well as governments and public policy and what have you. Um, so this viewer is asking, what is the role of the regulator in enabling innovation and the right investments and practices to use in this recovery phrase to get to net zero? Well, the CER has to oversee and work very closely with the impact agency of uh, 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 and, and, and I think the impact assessment agency, and I think, you know, I was reminded of a very recent example that, uh, you know, democracy is still alive and well in terms of the decisions that we make, the laws that we pass, and therefore the regulations that stem from them. And then the CER, you know, oversees those regulations. And a recent example um, was a, an announcement that I made on behalf of, of uh, Jonathan uh, Wilkinson um, on offshore oil. Okay, and, and environmental assessments for exploratory wells. We had some really bad regs and laws that came out of CIA 2012, the uh, Environmental Assessment Act uh, that came out in 2012, because, well, it's bad from our position because it didn't take into account the offshore. And every single exploratory well, which only lasts like 30 to 60 days, and it has a very low impact on the ocean floor and the environment, had to have a whole environmental assessment. It was so, uh, onerous and frankly worse than that. It took away from the integrity of, of the whole of, 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 of everything that we're trying to do and, and frankly our government was wearing it which was you know really quite foolish. It was taken up to 900 days just to get an exploratory well. It was considered like its own project. So what I announced yesterday is well that's no longer the case. It's going to be 30 to, it's going to be uh, 90 days, 900 days to 90 days. Now did we take away anything from the environmental integrity? No, because what no. we did was we did one big environmental assessment for the whole area and as Jonathan pointed out it allows us to actually look at how these areas are interwoven um, and you know how species move amongst them. So do it once, do it well, do, do the uh, stakeholder um, uh, uh, reach out, you know, well and do it once. I mean, we, we had a case where, you know, you had New Brunswick First Nations who were dependent on salmon that were swimming near these exploratory wells. They're in New Brunswick, this is 300 kilometers east of Newfoundland. And they're, and, and they're being consulted again and again and again on, on very, very similar things, wells that are just a few kilometers away from them. It just didn't make any sense. And it's something that I've had, so, you know, dog with a bone on that one. Um, so, you know, the, the, we're, we're, meant to, we're meant to spot CER has a role, I think, in, in making sure that, you know, bad regs don't exist, that we develop good regs based on the laws and intentions of Parliament. 
Um, I have very early on in my tenure sat down with uh, the, uh, in, the Indigenous Advisory Group to the CER, uh, and they do incredibly, incredibly thoughtful work on behalf of the CER, making sure that uh, there is uh, meaningful um, uh, consultation with, with uh, Indigenous groups that are uh, associated with proposed pipelines or proposed you know, resource development projects. Uh, something very close, you know, as you mentioned, near and dear to my heart. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that we put the CER now in, in a better place, in a broader place to fully assess all the consequences. And therefore, when you do that, and this gets back to the TMX decision, it allows us to make sounder, more thorough decisions that will hold up in court because we've done our due diligence. We've done the right and proper thing by making sure that we have consulted properly, particularly with, you know, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, so that, pro so that projects go ahead so that we develop and develop in the right way and that these things are considered. Ultimately, it allows projects to proceed, you know, as opposed to just digging in your heels and wishing that the world ain't the way it was or ain't the way it is. It is this way. It is this way. Embrace it. Let's take it on as if it's this way for a whole bunch of reasons that are very, very good. Let's embrace it. And that's how you move forward. I have another question here. The government announced the establishment of the Emissions Reduction Fund earlier this year. Can you provide an update on where it's at? The Emissions Reduction Fund? Um, uh, no, but I can, I can happily get back to you on that. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'll happily get back to you there. Yeah, okay. Because we can just get back to the, I'll just get back to the recovery group and give you an update. And actually what we do, yes, is we, we follow up. There are so many more questions than we can answer. So, but here, another question, Minister, you mentioned hydrogen. Can you expand more on where hydrogen fits into our energy mix and whether or not it is a focus for your government? It is very much a focus for our government. Um, uh, I mean, there, there are three types of, of, of hydrogen. Um, gray, you know, which is just blue. basic. You know, the, gray, blue, and green. Blue, like, yeah, and we're, we're looking at the blue and we're looking at the green. That's kind yeah. of what we want, you know. Yeah. Uh, blue, you know, it, it, it's, it's net neutral. Uh, it's, it's emissions that are captured. Um, and, and green, green is from the, you know, the electrolysis process of actually separating the hydrogen from, from, from water with uh, oxygen being the emission. And, and there is huge, huge potential for that. Um, I mean, green hydrogen would be, uh, would be net zero um, yeah. by definition. Yeah. And, and, and we'll, we'll have a comprehensive strategy on hydrogen by the end of the summer. But it is not new to Canada. I think it was 1915, you know, hydrogen was one of the first patents in the world and it took place in this country. By 1920, we had the first industrial scale production of hydrogen. Um, 1995, and I remember this, you know, you had the first hydrogen powered bus in Vancouver. Uh, by 2010 for the Olympics, he had a fleet of hydrogen buses. Now, uh, that, you know, and somebody would point out, and rightfully so, that fleet of buses was sold off and uh, uh, because, you know, the high maintenance costs that were involved. But we're, we're increasingly coming to that nexus now where we're able to bring those prices down and, and it, is, it is looking increasingly, increasingly viable to the point now where uh, I believe it's the IEA has been looking at the hydrogen market by 2050 is occupying about $2.5 trillion uh, in value. Um, so there is, there is a huge future in hydrogen. And my colleague, Jonathan Wilkinson, um, has worked long and hard in the hydrogen space for, for many years and speaks to it with a, with a great deal of passion. I've learned an awful lot from him, as I just reamed off um, about yeah. hydrogen. Um, you know, he, he's extremely passionate about it. It is, it is very much part of the future. Well, and you know what's interesting, I must say, I've come to the hydrogen economy discussion uh, as of late as well, but everything I'm reading, whether it's on Bloomberg, whether it's in The Guardian, other newspapers around the world, uh, the Australians, the Japanese are moving on hydrogen. Yes, Actually, they are. Uh, Prime Minister Abe had hoped that had the Olympics gone ahead, he was going to use the Olympics as a demonstration of the potential of the hydrogen economy in terms of a bunch of pilot uh, projects they wanted to showcase. Of course, that's not happening this year, at least. The European Union, their big trillion dollar or more, or more stimulus package. Yeah, which we're looking at really carefully. And, you, and you're seeing, you know, uh, Denmark is a country that has seen an incredible transition going from a huge coal emitting energy sector, uh, 
or a coal, you know, coal provided the bulk of their energy, and they have turned that around in really short order. We are learning a lot from these from these uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, a lot of what they're doing is is offshore um, wind, uh, which you know they have incented and managed to make work. Uh, how do you do that? Um, you know, again, we're a country. I'm, I'm particularly from a province got lots of wind. Um, you know, how do you how do you capture that and and in, in and, and follow in their footsteps? Norway gets an awful lot of attention in, in my province right now too, because uh, <laughs> because of you know they they are there are competitors to be honest with you on on the oil and gas front, and yet they you know they do an, an incredible amount in electrifying that industry to make sure that if 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 you are extracting oil, whether it be offshore or onshore. That you are lowering your emissions as much as you possibly can, and they're you know they're doing all sorts of things. They're electrifying their oil platforms, um, you know, by using hydroelectricity, which they have as well. Something that we're looking at very carefully. Uh, you can use wind power to make sure that you know these these rigs aren't uh, emitting the same amount. They they emit an awful lot in the production of of oil and the production of gas. That happens out out your way as well. Um, so you know that that all that all fits. These are areas that we can that we can learn from. Again, we've got to do so with a great deal of urgency. I get it, but you know, th these are proved. These are jurisdictions that we know. These are these are jurisdictions that, if we don't compete with, occupy the same space as us. You know, what can we learn from them in short order to start doing the same things here? You know, your point on electric. You got to be curious about these things. Yeah. Now, your point on electrification—that's an important one too, right? As we expand uh, the uh, electrification, uh, obviously we focus on vehicles a lot, right? electric vehicles. Mark Little from Suncor was out last week talking about uh, the challenge of, uh, or the potential challenge for electric vehicles uh, for the oil and gas industry. Um, I think we, we think of electrification in that space, but heating, to your point, industrial uses, right? Mm -hmm. um, it it, it uh, is certainly something I think uh, that uh, well, and I think it's in your mandate letter, actually, to it is. push uh, electrification uh, yep. throughout the economy, obviously working in partnership with industry and provinces. And that's, that's been proposed to us as something very effective that we could do. And again, it gets back to my point that you can't leave people behind and you have to, you have to, um, you know, you have to harness, I think, the collective will that we're seeing right now for, for change, but also you have to demonstrate to people that they can make a real difference and and uh so one of the you know one of the proposals before us i, I you know a lot of a lot of quarters brought this up is uh is is you know getting rid of range anxiety that's one of the biggest impediments to to evs is that you know people just get nervous being in what if i run out you know you could make the same argument about gas but we all know there's a gas station around every corner we don't we don't have the assurance, the, the, the popular assurance that there's an EV station right around every corner. And, you know, even if there was, how long would it take me enough, you know, if I'm driving across Newfoundland or driving across Manitoba or whatever, how do I know that it's there? How, how can I be assured of it? So, you know, that, that may go a long way. I mean, that's something we're looking at. I'm a big fan of retrofits, too. Absolutely. I mean, this isn't sexy. I, I get it. But you know what? If you, one of the biggest things that we could do in this country is residential and commercial retrofits of buildings. And not just new buildings. I'm talking about, you know, particularly government-owned public space buildings, and we could begin there, um, and then incenting people to to do it at home. I mean, this is this is high-value work. This is labor-intensive work, um, and and the savings uh, on on energy uh, through energy efficiency through people's homes. You know, if 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 you look at the the uptick when I mean, I remember I, I just moved to Toronto when they introduced green bins, and like in its first year, you know, this is the compost bins. It had like a 90% uh, usage. I mean, people just took to it right away. You know, and same with the same with way that people take to recycling. These aren't necessarily the most efficient things that people can do in order to demonstrate their commitment to the environment in any given day or any given week. But people feel like they're a part of something. They feel like they're part of the change. You need to begin there and move on to things that are more, amb and more ambitious and perhaps more efficient. But uh, home retrofits is something I, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of time for. To your point, if you do not bring civil society along with you, you're pushing uphill all the time. Whether you're in a democracy, right? for sure. Right? Yeah. Okay, we have talked about the importance of Indigenous participation. 
But I want to put a finer point on this, uh, in, and this comes from a question from one of our viewers. The for, he's obviously read all the mandate letters you people, uh, ministers, receive. The fourth line, I think it's probably paragraph, of every ministerial mandate letter outlines the importance of the relationship with Indigenous peoples to increase Indigenous participation in the resource sector. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people need access to capital. Alberta has created a $1 billion fund. Is there a pan-Canadian opportunity to do the same? Yes, there is absolutely a pan-Canadian opportunity to do the same. Um, uh, we, we have started, a lot of that work fell under my own old department at Indigenous Services Canada. Um, I, the, 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 the questioner, is, he's absolutely right, or she's absolutely right in, in pointing out that uh, it's in every mandate letter. Um, I think that's really important. So every minister is, you know, uh, has, to, has to be thinking of Indigenous participation and inclusion and ambition, I would argue, as well. Um, so yeah, there's a long way we could go. I mean, you know, my, my academic work was based on um, equity positions versus uh, royalty checks. And, and, you know, a lot of that, as my conclusions came to, have to do with both, you know, the capacity of, of a First Nation, Inuit or Métis, you know, of, of their ambition to do it but, and their capacity to do it. Ultimately, it's, it's their own choice and how they benefit. Um, we, are, we are looking at all sorts of different levers in order to make sure that uh, we, we provide uh, First Nations and Métis and Inuit with those opportunities because um, uh, it is their rightful, it is their rightful opportunity. It is, you know, it is, it is absolutely something that they should be a part of if they choose to be. Having said that, I mean, I've been to and spoken at uh, an assembly uh, twice, I think, an assembly of First Nations, assembly of chiefs, and seen uh, observed and heard uh, the frustration on the floor between groups that are very much pro-development, pro-oil and gas, you know, not a shock that, that a lot of them came from Alberta, and other, others who uh, said absolutely not. And, you know, each saying, get out of my face, let us do our thing. Um, you know, that's, that's the other thing, you know, that this, this is something, if you, if you go to school with Inuit, um, uh, with, with, with Inu, and at the time they were identified as Métis, um, but, but, you know, very, very different groups, um, very different nations, uh, very different ambitions, very different communities, very, very different parts of this country. There's no singular indigenous voice, you know, um, and that's deeply resented by, by many. There, it, this is complicated stuff. It requires, so when we talk about consultations, it really has to be from the, from the bottom up, not the top down. Um, you know, these are, the, the, these are people who are of the land. This is how they identify. And each part of the land of this of this land of ours, Canada, is very, very different. So the circumstances are different. Um, here's a question returning to something that we talked about, but I think more specifically around carbon capture utilization and storage. I've been noticing, I mean, it's not new that uh, many, including the IPCC, but Australia, Japan, see carbon storage utilize, uh, capture store, utilization and storage as a key part of a climate uh, strategy. Uh, here's a question around the Alberta carbon trunk line, which did mm -hmm. launch uh, in our province, Alberta, last week. What are your thoughts on carbon capture, utilization, and storage? Do you see more of these types of projects in the future? Because as I referenced, they're not cheap infrastructure projects. No, they are not, but they are integral to lowering emissions, to storing them, and, and you know, we are seeing great incentive now for uh, particularly the oil and gas industry to do it. So um, it, it, increasingly investors are looking for that sort of action and, and they're demanding it. Um, and, you know, this is very much state of play. I, I, you know, I can't, we are in the thick of this right now. Uh, we were going through this, uh, this transition. Um, before COVID hit, and you could feel, I mean, I, I've only, I was only sworn in, as you know, Anne, in November. The right. difference between November and January, February was huge. Um, and, and, you know, you could feel it. And, you know, going out, I, I went out to Alberta the day after I was sworn in, um, went out to Alberta, I don't know how many times, but I, I just remember that Innovation Summit the day after uh, speaking at Globe in Vancouver. And the change in tone from industry was remarkable because they could see the investment dollars were moving. They, yeah. they want to see significant, serious investment in lowering emissions. And that will include, for some companies and for some investors, carbon sequestration, carbon storage. So, so that incentive is taking place in the, 
in the best place, which is in the marketplace, I think. Um, you know, that, that does not mean, when I say it's the best place, I'm not holding up my hand saying you can wait for the market to move. Government has a huge role in these things, as you well know, can make significant investments and can incent and regulate. So, you know, uh, we have we have a huge role in this. All I acknowledge is that when you want to see really significant change in the marketplace, usually the best place to see sustainable change, uh, financial change, investor invest, investment change, is when the marketplace does it itself. Exactly. I've always believed the market is the most ruthless regulator you're ever going to find. I'm witnessing it. I think, you know, people who are watching it are witnessing it. Well, I think we, oh my gosh, the time is all gone. It's, we have two minutes left, Minister. Um, uh, so I think I'm being told that we have to wrap up. Um, it's unbelievable how quickly the time has gone. So I guess in wrapping up, sure. yeah. I have to thank you for spending this time with us today and talking about the future of energy as we come, uh, as we begin recovery uh, out of COVID-19 and think about what the world could look like after COVID. Um, and it's interesting, I was following some of the work of the IEA this week and um, uh, Everything is focused, you know, when you talk about the future of energy, so much of it uh, is premised on what governments do with their recovery plans, what they incent, what they provide disincentives for, um, how they see their mix of energy, are they investing in infrastructure that's carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen economy, um, renewables, and everybody's waiting to see what the world's recovery plans will look like because it will tell us a lot about what the future of energy will look like. And the world is watching us. That's and the thing. And, and so firstly, I would just want to commend the recovery project in Canada 2020 and to, uh, you know, I was told that there was a lot of people who were taking part in this. Uh, thank you all. I know a number of you are frustrated that we didn't get to, you know, something that I'm sure you particularly wanted to talk about or hear, hear from us about. Um, this, you know, I'm more than happy to keep this going in and, uh, and, and do this again. Uh, because this is absolutely essential. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to know how much time and energy was spent on constitutional battles. Um, that's not to say the Constitution is not important. I'm not no, sure. No, but, no. And especially former Minister of Justice um, and Deputy Prime Minister. But I would, but this is essential to us. Like this is, the world is watching us. We are the fourth biggest producer and the fourth biggest exporter of oil in the world. And yet, you know, we are a smart, progressive country that wants to get it right. And I can tell you one thing for sure is that every corner of this country, no matter where they fall in this debate, wants to be included in the answer. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds vague, but that's a great place to start. And I am determined to bridge those gaps because we, there is no other democracy on the planet that has bestowed the, amount, the bounty of natural resources that we have. So we, are, we have a very, very unique responsibility. The world is watching us and, and I am determined, I don't wanna leave anybody behind, that's impossible but we need to have a collective will coming out of this to make sure as many Canadians as possible and every region of the country is included in the answers to this. Minister, we want you to keep saying those things and we want you to keep fighting for the energy sector in this country. Um, it, it is in the middle or at the beginning of a transformation. We all have a role to play, so you keep fighting for this sector. Uh, uh, what I want to do now is, again, thank you, but also just remind people, if they want to listen to this conversation again, you will be able to find it wherever you get your podcasts. We will be there. And you can also re-watch this live stream at recoveryproject.org. So again, Minister, uh, oh, and I have got to say personally, I thought it was always easy to ask the questions. I now know. And you had a really tough job at CTV Canada AM. And it is definitely more difficult to have the answers. I can guarantee you that. And my apologies anyway, for the dogs. They're normally very quiet. They only like barking during uh, Well, thank you so much. And good luck with everything you're doing. And please stay safe, you and your family. 
thank you to everybody for being engaged in this. Thank you for everybody for, for caring about it. There are a lot of Canadians who care about getting this right. I'm with you. Great. Thanks so much, Minister. Thanks, Annette.